Welcome to Currents, a Norton Rose Fulbright podcast. I'm Todd Alexander, your host and a partner in Norton Rose Fulbright's Projects Group. Today, we welcome back to the podcast, Kimberly Sintera, CEO of Terra Pro Solutions, which is a consulting firm for renewable energy projects. She's here to discuss transmission project development. Kimberly, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Todd. I'm happy to be here. So transmission's been a big issue for the renewable sector for a long time, given that the wind may not blow exactly where people live or the sun may not shine exactly where people live, or for that matter, it's hard to cite things in areas that are densely populated where there's a lot of load. Um, can you share with us some of your experiences about transmission projects and those that you've worked on over the years and give people an idea of, of, of what has been done over the last few years to try to uh, make the transmission sector a better host for renewable projects? Right. Well, thank you for that question, Todd, because I think it's it's always the top of the mind when we're developing projects, right? You can have a, a, a great project, the wind's blowing or the sun's shining, but if you can't get the power to where you need to, then it, it really all becomes moot. And my earliest experiences with transmission actually go back to the days of the sagebrush transmission line in the late 80s, early 90s, which was at the time, 46 mile privately held transmission line, one of the longest, I think, privately held lines that had been built. Uh, Back in those days, it cost $28 million, which translated into today's dollars is about $76 million. So the acquisition costs were quite substantial. And um, my job was to work on all the curative work, which was to do all the title review, get the title policies issued. So, you know, back in the early days, that, that was, I think, the, when it, you know, the earliest days of, of transmission. Moving forward, as I say, it's, it's one of the pieces, you know, when we're looking at projects, we're looking at site location, we're looking at interconnection, we're looking at transmission, and we're you know, looking at access. And it's interesting because, you know, from a lot of standpoints, the idea is transmission can be, you know, easier. Maybe it's it's not as controversial, let's just say, as the project, but it has its its own set of, of challenges. And uh, we, we uh, worked on a project recently where they've done all the siting, pursuing their permitting, And then they discovered along their 25 mile transmission line that they had a restriction on title that affected a lot of the private land parcels where it prohibited development of any kind except pasture and grazing and farming. So it it can be quite a challenge to to get your transmission but it's so integral to the success of the projects. So when you're trying to put together all the land rights for a transmission project, what are, what are some of the biggest challenges? I know from working on gas pipelines, for example, there, theoretically, at least you have FERC to help you. Is there a similar type of um, assistance that can be called upon on the federal level to help you obtain the rights of way that you need? Or do you have to go out there and try to piece it together yourself? And for that matter, what other big challenges do you see? Right. So traditionally, exactly. You know, in in our sector and the private sector working on these projects, we had to piece together all the property ourselves. So we were going to have to look at, you know, what is the makeup? What is the ownership? And, you know, we want to make sure that we have, you know, um, you know, if you're, you're looking at it, is it all private? You know, do you have some federal lands? Do you have state lands? Do you have, you know, who else can be the holders of the property? I think understanding the ownership is really crucial because that's going to play into the permitting. And a lot of times if we're looking at feasibility, you know, a client will say, well, we want to stay off, you know, federal lands or we want to stay off state lands because they don't want to trigger some of the permitting. Traditionally, we did not have 
you know, the benefit of FERC and, and some of these other, you know, regulations to be able to, to step in, you know, a lot of the utilities, they have condemnation rights. So they have the ability, um, if they're not able to reach some kind of a reasonable agreement, then they have some kind of mechanism to try to use to, to acquire that, that right. But in the private sector in which we work, those rights don't exist. Now it's going to be interesting. There's a lot of conversation around transmission now, especially, and I think we see that because of what happened in Texas in February, and we're seeing a lot of mandates and legislation and a lot of other interesting pieces that are moving, you know, brought forward by our current administration and other groups. And so I think there's, there's definitely an interest and, and people are looking at this and there's a, you know, a lot of other incentives and ways that they're trying to be creative to provide some mechanisms to move forward transmission. So it'll be interesting to see how those develop and, and what they are. So you mentioned the federal government. I know the DOE has a plan in place to provide billions of dollars for transmission build out. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that program. Right. Um, and there's a lot of different elements to it. I, I think it's interesting that there's also an element to it that wants to try to provide some incentive on tribal lands, which we know traditionally has been maybe difficult to negotiate. So um, I, I think it's, it's definitely interesting. It, it, you know, it's going to require a lot of further review and due diligence to understand exactly how that's you know, going to benefit these projects and how we're going to be able to, to access those funds. But I think certainly it illustrates now um, something that I think the renewable business itself and the industry and the developers and sponsors have certainly been talking about for a long time. You know, we need to give this attention to transmission. So it's great to see now that a lot of these programs are are um, being put into effect. I, I'm sure as a developer, if I put on my developer hat, there's gonna be a lot of questions because there, there's quite a bit of space that we have to cover between knowing that there's a program out there and then being able to actually access those funds and then put them to work in terms of the project. So I think that part of it is still under review and being determined, but certainly it's very interesting that um, this has been put forward and that there's an interest in seeing this um, to incentivize the, the transmission rights and acquisition. What about the program the Department of Transportation has to try to get transmission lines built along public highways or um, other transportation rights away? Right. Uh, so certainly another really interesting piece, this idea of can we utilize rights of way? I think I also something, saw something along railroads and that type of thing. So, but I think some of the challenges that we may encounter is again, you know, the makeup of ownership. You have distinctions between federal rights and state rights. So along the lines of the analogy of if you have a transmission line and you know, most of it is private, but then you have a piece in the middle that can be public, then what are the implications going to be? So I, I think the other piece of this is going to be the permitting. You know, we really can't just isolate the, the monetary piece of this. We need to look at how that's gonna play into the permitting and a lot of the different requirements that are now in play. Because traditionally, you know, we would try to avoid some of the, um, the right of ways or look at those really carefully. I think the other thing that we encounter is we're always looking at this from the standpoint of financing and whatever we're going to get is going to ultimately have to pass that, you know, lender scrutiny, tax equity scrutiny. So what is the view going to be on those rights and, and how are we going to be able to ensure those for purposes of the project? So I think it's interesting. I, I think there's a lot of programs that are being advanced, but I still see uh, a lot of work to be done between, you know, the fact that we have these programs there and how they actually, actually will be implemented to be able to help and support our projects. What you've mentioned a couple of times now, 
the idea of maybe favoring private landowners over government landowners? What, what are some of the challenges of working with private landowners or the benefits versus working with the, a government landowner? Well, we talked about financing, right? And, and you know, typically when you think about these projects, you're working with private landowners, you know, you're presenting, let's just say your form of agreement that you know is going to be financeable, let's call it. You know, typically that's the starting point in these negotiations. And so there is a discussion that happens with the private landowners around those terms and conditions and what's going to work. A lot of times when you're working with governmental agencies or other types of agencies, you know, they present the document to you. And in some cases, it's kind of like, well, it's, you know, it's our way or the highway, right? <laughs> highway, you know, take it or leave it. And there's not always a lot of negotiation that happens. So it can be a challenge, you know, you can certainly get those agreements financed. And I think as we're looking at all these mandates and all this support, I think it provides the foundation to be able to assert to, you know, our lender parties and tax equity parties, there's, there, there will be, you know, a methodology for ha making that happen. But it is, um, it's a challenge when you're looking at the agencies, the types of things that they require. And, and I think also the timing, you know, working with private landowners in a lot of cases, you have maybe a little bit more control, not always, but a little more control over the timing and the speed at which things, you know, move. But, you know, a lot of times in the government sector, and I think certainly coming out of last year, um, you're going to see a lot of challenges with just moving things forward. I mean, I think we're seeing that in so many cases on our projects where, you know, things are held up either from a permitting standpoint or, you know, we, we do a lot of negotiations around federal loans that might affect properties. And, and those timeframes now are, are upwards of 12 months to be able to negotiate that documentation. So that will be another challenge as well, just timing. So beyond looking at uh, whether it's privately held or publicly held property, what are some of the other factors that you look at when you're doing a feasib feasibility analysis of a proposed transmission project? I think we're going to look at the land use. You know, um, it's it's a factor in terms of our of our projects. And I think you mentioned at the beginning of this, a lot of our projects are located away from the load. Uh, a lot of it is going to involve the land use. What is the current land use? Uh, and, they, and there can be some interesting aspects of that when we're doing feasibility. And I looked at a project recently where, you know, they um, engineered around uh, entire sections that were controlled by a, an oil, major oil and gas company. So um, we'll look at things like, is there a severance? We will look at other land uses. Uh, we will um, also look at the community and, and what are some of the concerns about the, around the community, you know, stakeholders, uh, transmission lines. Traditionally, they have to be above ground, especially servicing our projects. If you're talking about, you know, the smaller, lower voltage or medium voltage, you know, that can pretty easily be buried underground. But most of the transmission projects that we're going to be looking, looking at are going to be large scale, above ground, I'm sure in the excess of 75 feet wide. So you're talking about a pretty significant um, overhead, um, you know, improvement that's going to have to be installed, getting people uh, comfortable with that. So there's, you know, we, we look at those kinds of pieces. I think when you're talking about with, within right of ways and that kind of thing, which we're also looking at, you know, a lot of it is just the practicality. Is there enough space? You know, because and, and frequently in these um, public right of ways that we're talking about, these federal rights of way, let's just say along a highway, you've already got a lot of other transmission or other uses going on. So we have to be able to make sure that our use is going to fit and be compatible within whatever space is remaining that might be available. So. Um, a lot of those different pieces, we'll, we'll try to understand even the, the, what the overall engineering, you know, what are the structures going to look like? Because frequently our, um, 
Stakeholders are going to care about the structures. You know, what are they going to be wood? Are they going to be steel? How tall? So all those things need to be understood in terms of feasibility. You mentioned whether the um, transmission should be sited above ground or below ground. I live up here in the Northeast when it's winter time, the people who have the above ground wires, it seems like their power goes out. And I had always thought that it was really just a question of cost. <laughs> that if, if, if it was just expensive to put the wire underground, but if the population was dense enough, you, you kind of had to do that because it's the only way to get through heavily den densely populated areas. But you're making it sound like that's not the case. Is there, are there restrictions also in terms of voltage that you can't really put high voltage wires below ground either? Absolutely. Uh, there are cases where if you're talking about, you know, a 500 megawatt line, you know, that's not something that you can easily underground and, you know, because you're going to have issues around, you know, heat and that sort of thing. Um, and so it's definitely a matter of cost. Um, that's, that's a factor. It can be, you know, a million dollars a mile or more to underground. So, you know, that's not something that we're going to take lightly, but I think from an engineering standpoint, you know, sometimes it's just not feasible to be able to locate um, high, high voltage, you know, lines underground. How about building along the railway corridors? I, I know from working again on gas pipelines and also some of the transmission lines that we've worked on at Norton Rose, people often talk about trying to site it along existing rights away for the exact reasons that you're mentioning, where it's very tough to get land rights. And you also, even if you can get the land rights, you don't want to have public opposition. So you try to go where, where people, there's already something there. Um, does it, is that a, a, a kind of a preferred approach for a lot of people? What challenges does that present trying to go along the railway railroad route? Yeah, I, you know, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, I think some of the challenge that, that we've encountered specifically with railroad right of ways is first of all, which railroad is it that's in control? So believe it or not, ownership, it can be a question. Uh, we worked on one project here in California where the railroads have an agreement where it changes every 10 years um, the ownership of the railroad line flip-flops to another agency. So first of all, you've got to try to figure out which agency are you even going to be talking to. And then I think, again, when we look at, you know, specific requirements, the, the, the railways are just inherently because they have a certain liability that they have to make sure and protect they're very cautious as far as any kind of improvements that are going to be within that right of way. So there's going to be a very strict adherence to whatever their requirements are, whether you go over the railroad, whether you have to dig a culvert and go, go under the railroad. So I, I think that's what we've seen. But the biggest challenge for us is timing. We have a project right now that we are now over two years in the process of trying to get the right of way crossing finalized. And it's just, it's taken that long for them, you know, to be able to look at all the engineering, do all the review, and it's still not done. So I think, you know, that's kind of the other um, challenge that will face a project is just the timing, you know? So if you know you're gonna have a project in 2023 and you're gonna be crossing a railroad and you haven't already started that, you, you might, you can almost say, well, you're already behind. So I think that's the other challenge because a lot of times these projects, they're going along your engineering, let's go, right? And maybe your construction start is six months or nine months out, but certainly you're not necessarily planning for, you know, a couple of years, which can be the challenge with the railroad. Let's um, sum things up here. What, what do you think the next couple of years looks like for transmission development? What are your kind of thoughts on the industry and where do you think the most opportunity lies? I'm actually really encouraged because there's a more intelligent conversation happening around transmission 
with more solutions being put forward than I've ever seen. You know, we're looking at right of ways, we're looking at railroad right of ways, state, federal. There's, I saw even an article around some kind of a tax credit for transmission. So I think we're finally really having the conversation that we needed to have. And I think the parties that are starting to come to the table and agreeing that this is a really important part of the development of renewables and our ability to be able to meet our sustainability goals. So it's something, you know, it's kind of been, you know, the red herring in the room, so to speak. So it's now moving forward. So I think that's very important. And I'm really happy to see that that conversation is taking place. And I think it also helps us to be able to help our clients really look at this. The fact that there's going to be this support is going to make those conversations easier. Even if you're having those conversations now at the project level, the fact that there's so much emphasis being put on it as from kind of the political piece gives a great segue for us to be able to, able to have those conversations and say, look, this is difficult. What can we do to move this forward? So I think I see it as really being a huge benefit for the projects and especially certain projects that maybe this has been one of the primary challenges, which we have a lot of those. Good. Sounds optimistic, which is which is always good to hear. And I think there are if, if the clients coming to Norton Rose are any indication, it does seem to be a lot of focus put on this area and a lot of opportunity. So uh, hopefully there's uh, some good work out there for both of us. Yes, yes, exactly. All right. Well, thanks for being with us again, Kimberly. Thank you. Find us online at www.projectfinance.law or send us an email at currents at nortonrosefulbright.com. Please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast app. Our show today was produced by Emily Rogers. Stay ahead of the currents.